Thank you for taking the time for this conversation today. Uh, Dr. Ash, it's an honor to have this opportunity to learn firsthand about your life and your work. And I'm, I'm hoping we can touch on three general topics, uh, your, your personal history, your career, and your reflections on the field of research ethics. And I suppose the best way to start is at the beginning. So if you could tell me about your youth. Oh, well, first of all, I was born, of course. <laughs> uh, I was born in, uh, in Halifax County, North Carolina, uh, on, on August the 20th, 1929. I, I am the second child of, of two people, uh, Lee B. Ash and Inta Man Ash. Uh, my mother always told me that there were two significant days in the history of, of, of Halifax. One was the, uh, a lynching that occurred many years before I was born and the day I was born. So, so she, uh, she did that. I was very fortunate to, to have two parents who were very supportive. Uh, my father was a very smart man who worked hard. Uh, I was a child of, of, of the Depression. When, uh, when I was born uh, in 1929, America was on upswing. Everything was real happy-go-lucky. And by, by the time October came, depression came. So my father returned, was, was in Washington, working as a, as a newspaper reporter. And he lost his job because of the depression. So he returned to, to Halifax. Uh, to live with my grandfather, who was a uh, freedman. Uh, we always called him Lang Lang. You know, like most people give us a name for their grandfather. Uh, he was a very proud man who uh, was independent in, 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 in his living. Uh, Lang Lang was a, uh, had a son who got killed in the First World War. And he never got over that. So he would, all of his life, mourn the fact this is his firstborn child who was killed in a war that he didn't quite understand. And what happened was that in 1926, uh, the registration came for, for the election. Uh, Halifax was a very segregated uh, community, as you can imagine. But Lang Lang felt as though that he needed to do something to memorialize his son. So he got up one morning and put on, he, he was, he was a, a, a contractor by, you know, by profession. He put on his only white shirt, uh, his, his black suit, and told his wife, you know, fix me some breakfast. I'm going uptown. And of course, his wife said, for what? He said, I'm going up there to register the vote. She said, you know, Negroes can't vote. He said, well, I'll tell you what. I'm going to go up there today, and I'm going to vote today, or I'm going to die. And it doesn't matter which one it is. I'm dressed for either one. So he went to the, with, the, with the courthouse, got in line with the rest of the people who, who, who were going to register to vote. And uh, the sheriff came up and said, uh, uh, Mr. Ashton, you know that Negroes can't, can't vote, so why are you here? He said, I'm telling you the same thing I told my wife. I have a boy that's laying dead in that graveyard out yonder, and he is my right to vote. And, and I'm going to vote today, or I'm going to die, either one. So the sheriff walked off, and my, my uncle, who, who was a, his other, other son, uh, said, said, that damn old man going to get us killed. Because in those days, uh, you know, they didn't mind lynching black folk and shoot them too. So Lang Lang said, well, okay, well, whatever you want to do, that's your choice. So he got in line and <laughs> became the first black man in that county to register the vote. Uh, 
my, I, I told that story to my children, and they, you know, It, it, it was it was it was kind of hard, I think. Uh, you, know, you know, living in a segregated situation where you are, you know, trying to do what is right. Well, after that, uh, my father left left North Carolina, came to Washington, and uh, he the reason why he came to Washington, uh, that was where the jobs were. So he came to Washington and uh, started working in Recorder Deeds office. In, in the district government and became a recorder of deeds and everything. And he, he, he married my mother in 1926. 19, 20, 20, uh, they, they went to college together in a college called Kittrell College, North Carolina. Kittrell was a, a church-sponsored institution. So it was the, it was the only place that, that, that that black folk could go without, without having to justify their existence. Kitchell, Kitchell was a training ground for, for ministers. So, so my father was a, a, a very astute student who, who memorized Caesar's, Caesar's Garlic Wars for memory. If you're familiar with, 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 with the history of Rome, Roman history, you know that, that Caesar uh, fought the French, and it went something like all this Gaul is in the visible trace, which means all Gaul is divided into three parts. And he would recite that and tell me, tell me how, how he could do that. Uh, so I, gr I grew up in Washington and, uh, and, uh, and attended a, uh, a segregated school system. I, t I attended a school called Dunbar Senior High School. At that time, there were three high schools in D.C. that black folk could attend. Uh, one was Armstrong Technical High School, where, De where Duke Ellington attended. The other was Cardoza High School. And then there was Dunbar Senior High School. Dunbar was academic. They they train train you to prepare for a career in academia. I had pe people with high school who who had PhDs, and it was a situation where DC made sure that there was educational opportunity for black folk as well as for white people. So it uh, I graduated from Dunbar in 1946, and when I was 16 years old. And of course, my father, who was always uh, educationally oriented, uh, had always wanted me to be a doctor. And he, he, would, he said, you know, boy, you got it, you got it. You're going to be a doctor. Well, I, you know, I, I thought that was pretty good. So I, 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 I didn't want to go to Howard University. But he said that if I go to Howard, which was the the premier black institution in, in this country. And he, he told me that if you get a degree from Howard University, it's like a key to open doors, because Howard was known internationally for what it did. So I didn't want to go to Howard, Howard, of course, like most teenagers did. I wanted to leave. I wanted to go to West Virginia State College. I had a scholarship there. And the reason why I wanted to go, all my friends were leaving town, going away to school. But Daddy said, well, son, uh, that's well and good what your friends are doing. So he said, you need to apply to Howard. Well, I didn't. All summer, he kept asking me, you heard from Howard? I said, no, Daddy. Well, one day he came home from work, and he slid a, a piece of paper across the table to me. Well, he said, well, since Howard hadn't heard had me told you what they're going to do. I took the liberty to pick up an application, and you can fill it out, and I'll take it up and turn it in. I said, well, he's got me now because I can't lie anymore. So uh, <laughs> it's, this was during this, right the end of the Second World War. And, uh, and so I went to Howard, and I hated it. 
I, 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 so I tried to flunk out the first semester, and, and, but I made the dean's list and, and, and everything. Well, over time, I, I, I began to appreciate what, what my father was telling me. Uh, he always told me to, to be sure that you understand that you prepare yourself well, and if the opportunity comes, you, you, you're, you're ready for it. Uh, I, you know, it was a, uh, I had a happy childhood, you might say, in a sense, even though it was segregated. I didn't know, I didn't know, you know, segregation or anything at all because I was just a child. So what they did, uh, he and my mother uh, moved back to Washington and took my two brothers with me and left me in North Carolina to live with my grandparents. Uh, my grandfather was a, was, a, was a gentleman farmer named William Thomas Mann. He was, the, was one of the few black people that, at that time who owned his own land because his, his, his father, William Dudley Mann, fought in the Civil War. And when the war was over with, Abraham Lincoln gave the, the black veterans a mushroom outpay of $500. My great grandfather, William Dudley Man, took that five hundred dollar and bought a five hundred acre farm in Nash County, North Carolina, and that's the farm that I grew up on. I lived with them for until I was five years old. I, I didn't, you know, farm life was uh, happy in a sense because there was food prepared, there was fruit you could eat, you could walk along the path and. Eat, eat apples early in the morning, first, 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 first frost, and I, 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 I enjoyed that. Well, when I turned, turned, turned five, my parents sent for me. Uh, my, my father came down and said, you know, I want to take him to Washington so he can go to school. That's where he can be. I didn't want to leave. Didn't want to leave. I had not been used to lights, anything. So they put me on a train in Rocky Mountain, North Carolina, and gave me a, a, a lunch and told me, said, don't talk to nobody. And when you get to Washington, your daddy will meet you. Well, I remember very vividly, still in my mind, going across the 14th Street bed in Washington with all these lights. And man, I was, I was just overwhelmed you know, by this. So I, lay, I arrived in Washington when I was five years old. And, and I had been used to walking around, you know, barefooted all the time. I didn't wear shoes or anything. And most of the women were, to say the, the least, were not very pretty. They were just plain farm women. So they put me in a school in Washington called John F. Cook School to start school. Well, the problem was my older brother was, a very, was very smart. He was very sharp, and my parents were, thought I was going to be like them. Well, it turns out I, I had a first grade teacher that was pretty. <laughs> I mean, she was, I watched that woman walk back and forth the whole semester, and so they would have PTA meetings, and, and, and the, the teacher would say, well, Warren is a, is, a, is a nice child, he's no trouble, he's quiet. He said, but he can't learn anything. I failed the first grade. <laughs> so my parents used to pray for me. And uh, they would thank God, you know, for Willie, who was such a bright child. And they would thank God for Trudy, that's my younger brother, who was cute. And they said, well, Lord, have mercy upon Warren Kelly, that poor dumb child. <laughs> they said, somebody got to take care of him. So I, you know, I didn't, uh, it didn't bother me. I, I was happy just being dumb. Well, I, I, fl I flunked the first grade. And the next year, they, they, they gave me a new teacher. This teacher was not pretty. And I started thinking to myself, you know, if I better go and start learning something. Because this lady is not playing, man. She, she was not. She, she, was, she was just as bad as, she, I mean, she was mean. And, 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 and of course, I guess to make a long story short, by the time D.C. went through some, some uh, assignments to determine you know, intellectual ability, 
And when I got to the got to the sixth grade, they tested me for my for my IQ. And they found out that instead of being, you know, retarded, I was I had an IQ of 170. So they decided that I that I needed needed to be fast forwarded. So I, they skipped me from the sixth to the to, to the eighth grade. I never attended the seventh grade. Of course, you know, I was that meant I was a little bit younger than most of my classmates. So I went to Shaw, and uh, I had a teacher named uh, Ms. Piper, who was a was a math teacher, and she was very impatient with me, and she would walk walk up, you know, and ask you 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 need to have a problem on the board, you know, and she would you know yell at you. Well, one day uh, she was she was teaching, and she kept asking us, you know, well, what do you want to be when you grow up? And uh, I said, I want to be a doctor. She said, you'll never make it. And I thought that was kind of cruel you know, for, for, for a teacher to say it to a child. And I said, well, if that, that's, that's you know, your opinion. Well, it turned out that Washington was a city that was to teach school. You had to qualify through an examination called the Franklin, Franklin exam. You couldn't just say, I want to be a teacher. So most of the teachers were top notch. So I, I would I would have graduated from Shaw, and uh, it was a Shaw was a segregated school, of course, and there was a certain camaraderie that existed at that time, and I, I decided because of I, I guess and I consulted with my, with my parents about this that. The neighborhood I grew up in was a tough neighborhood. Uh, we, we lived next door to prostitutes. And I said, well, you know, that uh, everybody was more in, in terms of doing this. Out, out of that block that, we, that I grew up in, there were over 100 kids in, in that block. And only three of us finished high school, even though there were high schools within four blocks of, wh of where I grew up. And the, the Second World War was on then, and, and most of the, my classmates, or people who were my, my, my age, spent their time dancing, cutting school, and, and just not, not really behaving very, very well. So I decided that that wasn't what I wanted to do, that I needed to get out of that environment. So a, a, a classmate of mine named William Poti was taking music lessons across the street from where I live with a lady called Mrs. 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 Turner, who was the daughter of a of, of a, uh, a a black man who was named named Bundy, and he would come to the neighborhood and and take piano lessons and go back to his neighborhood, and I would see him come back and forth. So one day uh, he said, "Well." Uh, Ash, why don't you why don't you come you know in, to my neighborhood you know and, and meet my parents, and so I got permission to to leave that neighborhood and go to where where, where Billy Billy lived. Uh, Billy's family was the the uh, the ideal all American family. His father was a uh, worked in, a, in the arcade sunshine cleaners. Uh, his mother was was a housewife. And I would go have dinner with them, and Mr. Poti would say, would say to Grace, but we never could sit down to eat until Mrs. Poti came from the kitchen with an apron and sat, you know, and, 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 and she said, that was it. Well, I, I thought that was, my family was not like that, because my father had to work, my mother had to work. And, but I said, you know, maybe that's how I want to, be when my, my kids grow up, you know, you know, have, you know, have, have a father who is supportive for the whole family, a mother who is a homemaker. Well, if you can want to do that, you want to. It just doesn't happen, you can imagine. Well, anyway, I, so I graduated from Dunbar in 1946 uh, when I was 16 years old, and, uh, and because I skipped that. That year, you know, it kind of made up for it. 
And uh, and those were the happy happy days. You you make friends in high school over three years, they become lifelong friends. And and sure enough, that's what happened. Uh, I had teachers who who were the, the, the top notch. I had a man that taught me biology who had a PhD. Uh, the woman who taught who taught English was a had a master's degree. The, you know, and they they were the top notch people in in DC. So it was a uh, like, you know, as I look back on it, you know, a blessing. The fact that DC was segregated. Now that's hard for, for some people like me to, to admit that that, uh, that segregation was a good thing. It was a good thing for that time because we had the best teachers in DC in Dunbar High School. We took chemistry, took physics, uh, we we took German, Latin. Uh, it was uh, you know just a, a, a an amazing thing. Well, Dunbar was this: the first day, the first day of school, the principal came in and said, um, uh, "You know, I want to welcome you to Dunbar High School." And he said, "Let me ask you all." We were in the auditorium. He said, "One question: How many of you think you're going to college? Raise your hand." I raised my hand, sure, because I thought I was going to college. He said, "How many of you uh, are not going to college?" And then, of course, the kids uh, who were not going to raise their hands. He said, "Well, let me let's pause here and give those of you who did not raise your hand each time to to leave because Dunbar is an academic high school. We are college preparatory, and unless you prepare for college, I can't help you." Well, the reason for that was there were three high schools in Washington that black folk would go to. It was Armstrong Technical High School. Uh, Cardoza High School, who was, which was business, and Dunbar, which was academic. Uh, people who attended uh, Armstrong were preparing themselves for, for technical trains. People who went to, went to Cardoza were preparing themselves for, for business careers, in business, you might say. Uh, Duke Ellington went, went, to, went, to, went to Armstrong. Uh, it, so, so it was uh, interesting, it, it, you know, Interesting, you might say. Well, when I graduated, my father then decided, you know, to me to, you know, go to college. You know, he, of course, insisted that I go to Howard, and I went to Howard, and I made the dean list the first semester I was there. As it turned out, uh, I had a love affair with Howard since I was a child because my mother and father adored Howard University because that was the, you know, the the benchmark you know, for black folk at that time. People would come to come from California to have their children attend Howard to get a degree from Howard. And I, I, I wound up, actually, to make a long story short, not only getting my bachelor's degree from Howard, I had a bachelor's degree in psychology. And I went to Howard as a, as a pre-med student. And, but I had a problem with the idea of my father wanted, wanted me to be a doctor, but it was something about that just kind of didn't sit too well with me. So I used to uh, decide in my junior year to change my major from, from, from pre-med to psychology. Well, the psychologist practiced something called introspection. That was a process by which, that's, that, was, that was a Freudian concept. Freud. They never, never did anything to his patients except let his patients cure themselves. Introspective means you ask yourself a question, uh, like, "Well, why am I doing this interview?" Well, you you, you write it down. I'm doing it because you they asked me to, and then by getting to the point where it is that you decided I'm doing it because I want to do it. So introspection made me do this, and so I went through this whole process. And and how how is located in a place in D.C. It's uh it's, it was founded in 1867, uh, right after right after slavery, and uh, by a man named Oliver Otis Howard, who was who was who was a Civil War general, and it sits above a lake so blue, it was not really a blue lake, it's a reservoir. 
And that, that was the, the, the part of it. When I used to go, when I was in hell, and I would sit by myself, uh, most people thought I was a happy-go-lucky type of person because uh, that's what I you know what I would do. Uh, people live, there's a private you and there's a public you. The private you is the one that looks you in the eye and, and, and tells the truth to you. The public you is, is, is the behavior you put out to satisfy other people. So I would get by myself uh, because I was kind of a loner, and, and most folks, you know, you know, didn't realize that. And, and, and I decided that I wanted to really think about this thing about being a doctor. So one day it occurred to me that, that why can't I can't enjoy this whole process? And the conclusion I came to, I asked myself the one question, of what, what do doctors do? Well, the answer was they treat sick people. And it turns out, I came to the conclusion, I don't like sick people. So I couldn't, you know, being a doctor wasn't, wasn't something I could do. And that was no joke. I really, really did not like to be, I was never sick. So I could not see myself sitting in the office, you know, treating people, you know, listening to complaints. But I liked psychology because psychology did, dealt with behavior. And I found out after I was, took this major in psychology that girls were kind of flocked. So they wanted to want me to interpret their dreams. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, you know, you know that was a that was a, that was a part of it too. Is that one reason why why I want to be a psychologist? Well, another reason was that my mother was who, who was always uh, supportive of me. Uh, I would I would wear all my clothes. I wore hand me down. My older brother. I you know, you know, wear his wear a suit, you know, to he outgrew it, then they would come to me and they would give it to me. Well my mother decided when I was in high school that I start, you know, that she would satisfy it, that she would buy me an overcoat, a top coat that would fit me through the whole four years I was in college. So she bought me a top coat that was about four sizes too big. Well, that top coat hung, hung on me like, you know, like, like a shit. <laughs> I, think about, I think about it now, and parents do all kinds of things to, to survive, because we could not afford a lot, lot of clothes, and I knew that. Well, that top coat was a blessing, because when I, when I went to hell, I would go to football games, and I, and I could open that coat up and get three girls in there with me. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I, you know, I, I would go to a football game and be cold, man, and, and, and girls would say, well, well boy, let, let me get in your coat. Come on and get in my coat with it. Well, that went, went along pretty good, you know, and I, I played that to, to a hilt. And I, I decided I would join a fraternity, and of course, you know, that fraternity, everybody could recognize me by this coat and this fat hat I wore all the time. So in the meantime, I came along then, and, uh, and I, I had not met my wife yet. Uh, I met her through a blind date. That was supposed to be a blind date, did not take, not take place. Uh, a friend of mine named William Anderson was dating her roommate. And in those days, the girls couldn't leave campus unless they went in pairs. So Bill said, that, Ash, I'll tell you what, why don't you come on and come on with me and let me? I'm gonna take Margaret to movies, and you can take her roommate Grace along with us. I didn't know who Grace was. I mean, and and nor did she know who I was. So I I agreed to do it, but I still had not met her. So one day uh, I w I went to the cafeteria, and this girl was was surrounded by boys, uh, and she was just holding court like girls do. And I walked up and said, how you doing? She said, well, who are you? I said, I'm Warren Ash. He said, oh, yeah, so you're Warren Ash. Huh? When I'm Grace Ash, Grace Hubbington. I said, okay, fine. Uh, you know, that was it. But she never, never went, went on the blind date. She didn't, she didn't play that. Well, when, uh, when she, she came, she stayed in hell one semester. And I always swore that she came to hell to get a husband. 
she she denies that, of course, even now. Well, Bill and I were ran track together, and so we would go to go to the gym, and the gym was was right next to to to, to a dormitory, and and it was it was nice. Al had a pretty campus, so when school closed, we were lying under a tree in front of the gym. And uh, and Bill was looking down down the campus, and I was looking up the campus. He said, "Ash, I tell you what, there's somebody coming here to see you." And it was Grace and her mother. And she introduced me to her mother and said that uh, that this is the boy I've been ta- telling you about. And and so so I said, "Well, where, where do you live?" I didn't know where she lived. And she told me she lived 929 Kirkwood Street in Wilmington, Delaware. And her mother said, well, why don't you come to visit us if you will? Well, you know, the thing about it, that's one thing to say, come to visit, another thing to do it. So I decided, well, maybe I'll do it one of these days. So the summer went by, <clears throat> I, was, I got a taxi cab to pay my tuition through school, and I would drive my cab around Washington and everything. And one day I decided I would go drive to Wilmington to see Grace. Well, I caught the bus instead of driving, and I got to the train station, and she had gone to, to, to Atlantic City. And man, she came up, had a beautiful suntan, boy, man, she was radiant. I said, man, she's a pretty girl. So, so uh, that was the beginning of, of my courtship, of my wife, of a courtship and call it that. But, uh, but I, I had no, I never asked her to marry me. But she, she told me <clears throat> that, that I was going to marry her because uh, I was in love with a woman from Niagara Falls named Florence Young. And I would tell Grace about Florence, and she said, well, I don't know why you tell me about her, because you will marry me. <laughs> Women know when they find a man they, they think might be worthwhile. So we decided to get married on September 9, 1951. And uh, it was on a Sunday, of course. And by that time, the Korean War had just, had just, just started. And they were drafting people to to serve in the armed forces because nobody was volunteering to cause that. And of course, Harry Truman sent me what they call a welcoming letter that I had to be inducted into the armed forces uh, by September the 9th. Well, one of the problems there was that, that this was my senior year in college. And because of my father, who wanted to see me graduate, I got a deferment to act after I graduated. And the draft board said, OK, uh, we'll call you later. Well, that was fine with me. So that summer was just a, you know, a, a nice summer to do nothing then, because I knew I was going to be drafted. And of course, I was insisting on saying, why should we get married? Because I'm, I'm going to go into service. You know, and, and that's no way to start a marriage. But Grace said, well, a little time together is better than none. So we got married September 9th. I got my draft notice report for induction into the armed forces on September 12th, three days later. And I went down that morning, on, that morning, said goodbye to my parents and said, look, I'll, I'll be home tonight. But I got down to, to the induction center, and there were a whole host of men, you know, being being drafted also, and I had applied for to become a personnel officer in the Army because of my degree in psychology. <coughs> so this man came, he said, he counted, off, counted off 12 men, said, you 12 men take one step forward and raise your right hand. And I'm saying to myself, us college graduates are already getting preferential treatment because they pick, they're picking us out. He said, well, you know, I swear to defend the Constitution of the United States, you know, this, this kind of stuff. He said, okay, now go into the corner over there, and there's, there's a sergeant there who will take some more history from you, and he will complete this interview. 
So I said to myself, look in the corner, and this sergeant man was, was, didn't have an army uniform on. He had a, a green uniform on with ribbons all across his chest with hash marks up in there the sleeves. And I'm saying to myself, that's the damnest looking army sergeant I've ever seen. So he sat me down and said, well, son, tell me something. When you get killed, where do you want your $10,000 sent? And I said, well, who gets killed with what $10,000? He said, well, there's a good chance that where you're going, you will, be, you will get killed. I said, well, well what about this $10,000? He said, well, you know, Uncle Sam Gunch insures all of his servicemen for $10,000. So you name a beneficiary. And I'm saying to myself, this woman got married on Sunday, and he, on Wednesday, he's going to her at $10,000, man. Man, that, that's, that's more than just, that's, you know, low pay. That's, that's, that's high, high price stuff. And I said, well, okay, well, where am I going? He said, you're going to Paris Island, South Carolina. And I'm, been, I'm, I'm arguing with the man, and I said, well, look, I don't, there's no army base in Paris Island, in South Carolina. He said, no, there's a Marine base. You are now a U.S. Marine. I said, you got to be kidding. Well, all I knew about the Marine Corps up that time was what I saw in the movies. But John Wayne going up, Iwo Jima, man, and people trying to do everything else. So I, that day I, I called my father and told him you know, where I was going. Daddy got mad. He cussed her and Truman all day long. Uh, Grace cried. And uh, they, I, I became a U.S. Marine and uh, went to Paris Island. And I decided that if I was going to be a Marine, I'd be a good Marine. And I always look back on it now that that was the worst day and the best day in my life. Because the Marine Corps taught me things that you know, civilian life didn't do. The, the Marine Corps taught me discipline to be able to overcome adversity uh, in bad situations. They had a motto that, that uh, I still remember. They said that difficult, we do immediately. The impossible takes a little time, but let it be done. And so I lived my life on that principle. I believe that, that, uh, that God has has touched me in a way that is unique, and I trust His judgment. So I went down with the Paris Island and uh, and went through boot camp. And I decided I wanted to be an officer, so I, so I applied for OCS. And they said, well, we, we, we'll deal with that at your next duty station. So I finished boot camp. Didn't, they didn't send me to OCS. They sent me to Camp Pendleton in California for, of all things, advanced infantry, infantry training. The Marine Corps had a philosophy that everybody, regardless of what their military occupational specialty was, were basically an infantryman. So that was advanced infantry training in Camp Pendleton. And, uh, and so, so I, went, I, went, I went, of course, and, and, uh, and still believing that I would eventually go to OCS. Well, well Camp Pendleton was the where they would train you in advanced infantry techniques, and you understood how to, to operate in the Marine Corps genre. The Marine Corps believed that, that you don't deal with a whole host of people. Four men, four men, called a fire team, can fight and conquer a larger number of men. You have a fire team leader, a a, a BA armament, automatic reference man, and assistant fire team leader. And those four men live together. They, 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 they plan their, their attack together, and they moved as a unit. Four people, that was all. So, so I decided that, uh, that uh, I, well, because I was small, they made me a, made me a, 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 a bar man, browning automatic rifleman. And that's what they told me. 
So I carried this this thirty pound rifle all through Camp Pendleton, uphill, downhill, over hill, over dell, what they what they want to call it, and and of course the Marine Corps uh, uh, believed that uh, they are the best fighting force in the world. So I so I I, I was scheduled to to leave leave, leave uh, Camp Pendleton, and and they told me I was going to Korea to uh, to join a, 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 a infantry outfit over there. It, well, it, it didn't bother me, so they marched us around that Saturday morning, and this general made a speech about, you men are the best fighting force in the world. We have trained you, and you, you can do anything. And the Marine Corps assures you that we'll, we'll send you there and bring you back, dead or alive. I said, man, all these people come up talking about being dead or alive and everything. I'm going to be the exception. I'm going to go to Korea and I'm going to come back in one piece, I thought. So um, they marched it down to the dock at San Diego Harbor. Well, it turns out that, uh, that uh, I was, because I was a, a, a radio operator, uh, they assigned me to, 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 to uh, a platoon headquarters to work with a guy, a sergeant named Sergeant McElfresh who was a gunnery sergeant. Sergeant McElfresh had killed 26 Japanese in the Second World War in hand-to-hand -hand combat. He was a tough sucker, they say. And a man named Bill William Tupac, who was a, a Navy corpsman. The, the Marine Corps didn't have its own set of uh, corpsmen. They, they depended upon the Navy. Bill was a, he knew what, you know, knew the ropes. So we marched down to San Diego Harbor to board ship to go to, go to Korea. Well, Bill told me, so Ash, I tell you what, uh, there, there are over, over 6,000 men on this ship, and they, they called, they, they, they called, they said, Chow call. He said, We wait till all these men get through. We may not get in the east. He said, Come on, I'll show you how to get, get through in, to the front of the line. <coughs> the line. And by that time, the ship is kind of, you know, moving a little bit. And uh, I felt a little bit squeamy. I didn't know what it was. Uh, but when it was, I was seasick. I, I got seasick in San Diego Harbor before we got to, get, got, to, got, to, got to see. I stayed sick for 12 days. Sergeant McElfresh, this, this hard-nosed sergeant who, who killed all these men, nursed me for 12 days. He, he held my head, he fed me saltine crackers and V8 for 12 days to keep me alive. He thought I was going to die. I thought I was going to die too. That, that ship, man, the ship just went up, up and down. And I was praying, I said, Lord, if it just stop moving for a minute, I can make it. Well, we, we made it across, okay, and, and landed at, at Kobe, Japan. In, in, the, uh, in, in Japan, which was a then by that time. <clears throat> Under, under the, 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 the American leadership, because the war was, was uh, the, because the Second World War did that. So we got, we got to Kobe, and the first thing I got to Kobe was that to, to, I got well. I wasn't sick anymore. The, see, the ship stopped moving. And we went downtown in Kobe, and had, I had one of the best steaks I ever had in my life. Because I, by that time, I was hungry. And so uh, we stayed there about about a day, and they they came they, they had had a roll call and said, okay, you men are going to be uh, transferred to Korea. Uh, so what they did, they they flew us from 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 Kobe, Japan, to the Pusan in in South Korea. And in, in 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 Korea, because by that time the United States had already. Uh, cleared out you know, most of the, the, the Korean, uh, North Korean soldiers and everything. So I was assigned to, uh, to First 90 AAA anti aircraft outfit, and our job was to maintain the Pusan perimeter to, to you know, to protect that. And, and, uh, so, and so, so I, I decided that, that uh, I didn't decide, they, they, they told me what they do, I did what they told me they do. So the first night there, 
uh, the, they decided to test these guns to see whether they were accurate or not, man. And the whole earth shook, boom, man. And I said, man, what in the world have I gotten into? Well, my whole objective was, see, if I can stay alive while I'm here and get back home, I'll be okay. So my whole, I, I, I did, I got to Korea and I joined this outfit. I decided that by, by virtue of circumstances that because of certain things that people said, I had to, I had to be different. And one of, the, one of the guys in the outfit was, a, uh, was, 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 from, was from Kentucky. He would come into, come into my tent, you know, every day, and, and he would make some big announcement and say, I hate niggas and gooks. Well, of course, niggas mean black people, and gooks meant Koreans. And so I decided, well, you know, you know, that's not proper for him to keep saying that. So I told him, well, I said, tell you what, if you keep talking about niggas and gooks, I'm going to kill you. And so I took, this, took my bayonet out and said, tell you what, you know, if you say nigger one more time, I'm going to find out what you had for breakfast. I was going to cut him from his navel to, to his belly button, you know, everything. And... He, he didn't fall asleep for two days. <laughs> I mean, he, he, and, and cause he knew I was serious. Because one thing that they knew, even though uh, he, he, he hated black people, but he knew that black people would cut you. And so I played on that. And for two days, man, I didn't sleep, he didn't sleep. So after two days, uh, he was so tired, man, and I was tired too. He apologized. He said, Ash, I didn't mean you. I said, what did you mean then? I'm some other, I said, he's some, I'm some other, other niggas, because you are different. I said, there you go again. Still using, using, using that word. Well, Arnwine was a, uh, was a tragic course. He used to write his wife every day, how much he loved her, you know, everything. And, and, uh, and all of a sudden, he stopped writing. And his wife wondered why. why. Well, what the reason why he stopped writing her what, 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 what the Army did, and the service did, they gave you what you call rest and R&R and &R from Korea back to Japan. And when the folk went on R&R, &R, you know, they, these are men who had not been around women, and of course they would just go out and, and what would happen, they would get hooked up with Japanese prostitutes. And on one went there on R&R &R and, &R and fell in love the Japanese prostitute and stopped writing his wife. I decided that I would not go to R, &R. So for, you know, not because of anything innately goodness of me, I just decided that that's not what I wanted to do. Now, how long were you in the Marines altogether? Two years. Two years, and yeah. then um, you came back to the United States and did you continue your education after that? Yeah, because what happened is that, uh, that uh, I, I came back and, of course, uh, Eisenhower was president by then. Eisenhower ran on a ticket against Adlai Stevenson, assuring mothers of America that if he were elected president, he would go to Korea and negotiate a reasonable truce and bring the boys home by Christmas. Well, that was in, in uh, the fall of 1951. So I said, well, I, I ain't going to come here, man. We gonna, I'm going to be home by Christmas. Well, I waited. Christmas came. Christmas went. Eisenhower came. He went, too. But he, he, didn't, he didn't negotiate a peace because the war was still on. So, uh, so I, I made a decision, a conscious decision, that I had a reputation that I always thought that uh, that I always believed that 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 that, uh, that 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 I was special, and because of the fact that I was black, and I was I was the only black in my outfit, I refused to go to go to R and R to Japan, and I also never drank. So for for that whole all that time up until that Christmas, I didn't have a drop of drink. Well, when, when Christmas, when New Year's Eve came, and I was still there, uh, a, a fellow named Sergeant Lash, who's uh, 
with, with one, of, one of my teammates, uh, stole some army uh, liquor, some peach brandy and stuff from the army outfit down, down the road where, where we were. And he came back. He said, Ash, I tell you what, if we can't get home, we can get drunk. And I took one sip of that peach brandy, and that's all I remember. I was, I was knocked out. Well, now, while, while I was knocked out, nobody was guarding us against the enemy. And when, when I came to on New Year's Day, the sun was bright and shiny and everything. And I had, I, had, I had the worst hangover you can imagine. And all through our camp, the North Koreans, or most of the Chinese communists, had walked, had walked around among us while we were, while we were, we were asleep. And, and, uh, and so we came out. Well, what happened is that, uh, that I, I went and served my time there. And one day, uh, the, my commanding officer called me and, and told me he had good news, that uh, he was authorized by the Marine Corps to make certain men officers and gentlemen. And I said, man, this is something. So he said, look, ask you, I've been, then you've been, you're one of the men that I can pick out to make you, make you a second lieutenant. And you become an officer and a gentleman. And I said, well, Colonel Chapman, that may be well and good, but, uh, but what does that require? I was always asking questions. That was one of the problems I guess they had with me, is that, uh, that, that while I obeyed orders, I never took orders just because somebody said so. He said, well, what it is is that because we're losing so many six second lieutenants, you know, in, in combat, we want to make you an officer, a gentleman, and you become a second lieutenant in charge of, of, a, of, a, of a infantry platoon, which I would be moved from where I was in Pusan up to, to the front line. Well, the Marine Corps lost, lost a, lot of, a lot of second lieutenants. They did. So I, I decided that, uh, that uh, I would think about it for a few days. And I turned it down because uh, I had a wife to worry about. And I had to, had to worry about some other things, too. I didn't think, think I want to spend another nine months in Korea to become an officer. So I said, no, thank you. So I, I, so I, I stayed there until from, from February of 1952. At the one rather, until uh, March of 1953, and they by then uh, <clears throat> they shipped me back to the United States, and uh, and assigned me to to the third third Marine Air Wing in uh, in uh, Opelika, Florida, just north of just north of Miami. Well, the, the thing about that was uh, was this that uh, that I, I was sent to Korea to free the Koreans. I got to Florida, and here it was, I could not do certain things in Florida because of segregation. Uh, one day, uh, we decided we would go to Miami Beach. So we piled into this, in this car, this guy, one of my, one of my uh, colleagues had a, a black Buick, Buick Park Avenue, not, not Buick, uh, Whatever the, the, car, the car was, and we were driving down <clears throat> Arthur Godfrey Causeway toward Miami Beach, and the sheriff stopped us. He said, "Where do you boys think you're going? We're going to Miami Beach." He said, "No, you ain't. You get your black ass over to Hill Hill Beach, for, which was for Negroes, because Miami Miami Beach was for white people." Man, I felt insulted. I said, man, here I've been here fighting for freedom overseas, and I'm back in this country, and I can't go where I want to go. Well we, well, we didn't go to Hill Beach. We turned around and went back to the base. So when, uh, so when, when, uh, when, when we got back there, we decided, well, okay, we'll just do what, 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 what we know. We just won't go to the beach, that's all. But, but what happened was that I, I, I was coming home on leave, uh, my last leave before, before I was discharged. 
And so I, so I road raced until I was coming home. And uh, the thing about it, we, we could go anywhere we wanted to as long as we stayed on, on, on the military base. But when you came off base, segregation came into it. So I caught the bus to go downtown Miami Beach. And another black guy <clears throat> got on that bus too. There were only two seats on that bus left over. I said there was, he sat way across from me. So the bus is going downtown Miami Beach, you know, toward Miami. And halfway down the, the bus stop, and the driver got up and said, I, I, I can't move this bus unless you, unless you two guys, he didn't call us guys, he called boys, sit, sit together. So we sat there in the heat for, for about 10 minutes. And uh, cause I said, I'm, I, I don't know him, why should I sit beside him? And he said, because I said so. I said, well, the hell with you, I'm not moving. And the other black guy didn't move either. So we sat there in the sweltered heat, man. This man was so, this man was so mad. And what I didn't realize, I think about it now, in today's time, he could have shot, he could have shot me and could have gotten away with it. So, so, so I, you know, you know, that was my protest against, against segregation, you might say. Uh, I came home and, uh, and you know, and, and having been, been away from home for a year, uh, I came back to this young wife that I had married two years earlier that I didn't really know. And, uh, you know, you know, but, you know, it was, it's, well, what do they say that, uh, that mar <clears throat> marriage is a lifetime proposition, it, it was, it's not designed to be like a revolving door. You, you, you love, honor, and not so much your faith, but respect all the days left until death do you part. So even though I was frustrated by the fact that I, did, that I was married to this woman, that I didn't have the opportunity to know, we never had a honeymoon, never had a chance you know, to really Look, look at what marriage is about, because I didn't have time to do it. Well, when I came back from Korea, you know, I was, uh, I guess, in the vernacular, I was hard to try. I was going to make up for lost time in all respects. So uh, I came home and spent that leave, that leave and left. Grace writes me and tells me she's pregnant. So I said, well, you know, that, that's something you, you, you pregnant. I just, just, I was just home, man, a few, a few days, man. I mean, powerful stuff you're talking about. So uh, it turns out that, uh, that uh, my oldest daughter, Taria, was born in 1954. We, we had, we, we wound up having five children three girls and two boys. Uh, Terea was the oldest one. The second one was a boy, and we named him Warren Robert. Warren after me and Robert after her, her, her father, who got killed when she was three years old. And a third daughter that Grace made her, her name up and contracts uh, her mother's name and my mother's name. That poor child, and even now, she's still plagued by the fact that she can't even pronounce her name. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so we decided to call, call her Lenny. And her real name was Elethia. <laughs> well, poor Lenny, man, went to school in first grade, uh, and she came home one day. She's crying, boy, and everything. Because to my daddy, guess what happened? They don't, they, they don't have my name on the road. I said, yes, they do, Lenny. What, what did they call you? They didn't call me anything. They didn't call me. They didn't call, I said, your name is Elethia. She said, it is. Because <laughs> <laughs> I, I told Grace when the children were born, she would ask me, what shall we name this child? If I had my way, I said, well, I don't give a who. What you name him? You name, I don't have time to deal with that because uh, I, I was determined 
to make up for two years of my life of going back to school and doing what I was, was trained to do. Well, you know, what, what happened was that, uh, that when, uh, when I came home from, uh, from Korea, it was, uh, and with Eisenhower and his business, that we were in, a, in what, was, what, is, what is called a recession. A recession is an is a economic program that goes like this. A recession is when you lose your job. A depression is when I lose mine. That, that was it. So we were, we were in a recession then. And uh, jobs were hard to find. So I, got my, I, I came home and, and got my cab back, which I was driving when I was senior high in, in college. And, you know, looking, looking for to see if I could get a job. Well, it turns out that, uh, that uh, one day in, 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 you know, going through town, I picked a man up at the corner of, 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 of Connecticut Avenue and M Street Northeast in Washington. He wanted me to take him to first in Bryant Street in Northwest Washington. So, so I took, took him there and let him out. And I started thinking, well, my best man from, from my, my marriage lived in a 100 block of U Street. I said, I think I'll stop by and see and see if Sam is doing it. And I got there, and 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 to me, what this uh, it makes me feel like that God has a God has a plan for all of us, and He works in His mysterious way to make make that plan work. It turns out Sam was home from work that day in the Pentagon, sick. I said, so I rang the doorbell and Sam, I said, well, Sam, how are things going? He asked, well, Ash, how are you doing? I said, well, I'm looking for a job. I can't find a job because there were no jobs. And so she, she casually mentioned the fact that her next door neighbor had applied for a job at a place called the National Institutes of Health in Bethesda, Maryland. I never heard of NIH or anything it did. And so I let it go. And went on and kept driving my car. As life would have it, I was driving again now back to Connect Avenue M Street and picked a man up who told me to take him to a real estate office in Bethesda, Maryland. Well, that was way out of the way. That's not where I, where I used the cruise. And I, I, so I drove, I drove him out there. <clears throat> And, uh, and let him out. I thought that system out here, I could see if I could find this place called NIH. And I kept driving up Wisconsin Avenue, and all of a sudden, on the, on the, the right-hand side was this big this structure, which was Naval, the Naval Medical Center. The left-hand side was a sign that said, National Institutes of Health, U.S. Public Health Service. That's where they were. So, so I decided, well, since I'm out here, I might as well put an application there, see if I can find something. And, and, I, and, and uh, I went in, I, I did, I tend to take the take examination. So I wanted to become a biologist. And I told them I hadn't been having a degree in biology, but, but I had taken biology courses in college. <coughs> And when they converted my, how was on what was called a quarter system. When they converted my quarter hour to semester hour, I was one hour short of qualifying to be a biologist. So I asked them, I said, well, what do you have then? They said, well, uh, you, you haven't right, quite got the academic background to be a biologist. And so l let me see what I can, this, this man is, he, he's being very kind to me, he thought, he said, well, I'll tell you what, uh, what it is that, that uh, you don't have, you have, you have enough courses to be, be a technician. But the problem is that uh, GS3s is, 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 uh, is, is, is available to you, but you don't qualify that because you don't have experience. 
you you don't have enough background to be a JS4. I said, well, what do you have? He said, you can become a GS1. I had never heard of a GS1. So what that was was a GS, GS1 is the lowest grade that you can supply to the federal government with. It, it's it's the, the, the grunt portion of it. I said, I'll take it. He said, well, son, you know, you are a college man. Why, why do you want to take, take this? I said, sir, look, I got a wife and a, and a baby. To feed, and I'll do anything to make sure that they're comfortable. So he hired me as a GS1 bottle washer. Well, I never told my they were, they were my father to know, you know what I did. So I used to have dinner with them, and I always kept my hand in my lap so he couldn't see my hand because my hands were waterlogged from putting, going down in this tub, you know, digging up these bottles and everything to clean them. Use a, 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 a the church called Solax. So uh, every time I had dinner with him, I kept my hand in my lap. So one Sunday we were having dinner with him and my mother, and uh, I forgot myself and put my hand on the table. And my father said, Warren Kelly, what kind of, what are you? What do you do that job you have? Well, my wife being as she is, said, Mr. Ash, Warren's a bottle washer. I wanted to smack the crap out of him because I didn't want my mouth. My father didn't know, you know what I was doing because this man had, had educated me, and this is all I can bring back to him, is being a bottle washer. So Daddy said, well, son, are you good at it? I said, no, I hate it. He said, I'll tell you what, at least it's a job. You go back and become the best bottle washer they ever had and watch God work on you. So I did. I became the best bottle washer they had. I washed bottles made with nobody else would, all kinds of stuff. And so NIH was just uh, beginning to, to, to expand now. And so what they would do, they would, they would uh, send you off for interviews for, for better jobs. And uh, they would call me and go interview for a job. And I didn't have sense enough you know, to just be dumb. I was asking questions like, what are your controls? What are your statistics? <laughs> what statistics are you using to, to, to modify and confirm your results? And most people said, well, you know, you, you're, not a, you want, you're doing something that uh, asking questions that had nothing to do with being a technician. So, so, I, so I would go back, go back to the classroom and they said, well, this is it. So I, so I worked, worked for that job for, from, from December the 7th, 19, 1953 until May of 1954. And, uh, one day I got a call to go interview for a job in Building Seven. Building Seven was a was a, was, was called the Death House. People in Building Seven worked on stuff like TB, polio, infectious diseases. Was what it was. Well, I was not a I didn't know anything about viruses or anything else. So I went to the interview over there, and and, uh, and that that year. 1955, John Endres from Harvard had just got a Nobel Prize for, in, for working on pol poliomyelitis. And, he got, he, and so this laboratory, Dr. Carl Hable's laboratory, was focused on working with polio. So I would then talk to a guy named David McBride, who was a, who was a, a, a public health service dentist from Minnesota. And uh, he Pulled these, had, they had these, these, these roller drum in, you know, full of test tubes. And he pulled one out and said, you know what these are? I said, no. He said, these are monkey testes. And of course, I said, oh, a monkey test. You got monkey testes in a test tube? So yeah, this is tissue culture. That's what we do. 
Uh, and I couldn't answer a single question. I, he asked me, did I know anything about acid bases and this kind of stuff? I, 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 I was being very honest. I really did, didn't know. You know, I figured, well, I guess I blow that job. One job said I know too much. This job said I don't know enough. So he sent me back to the classroom and, uh, and uh, he finished washing bottles. And then about two weeks later, I got another call from him to go interview with him again. And he asked me, are you sure you don't know anything about tissue culture? I said, man, if I did, I would tell you. So he decided to hire me. And I, uh, mainly because of the fact that uh, he told me later on, we, we became friends, uh, and he told me why he hired me. He said, I was the only one of all the people he interviewed that told the truth. That in those days, you did not learn virology in a university because it was too expensive. You learned it at under, 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 such places like Johns Hopkins, Harvard, and NIH. That was it. So all the virologists in the country were trained at either one of these three institutions. Said you can't be a scientist unless you honor the idea that science and politics no mix. So, so he hired me, and I became, uh, over time, uh, his assistant. I got promotions, uh, as he would tell me, from being a, a GS1 to GS3 to GS5 to GS5, GS7. And, and of course, because of the, the situation was that uh, they were hard, hard, hard promotions to get. Uh, NIH prided itself on being the premier research institution in the country. And they swore that they only hired the best. Even the janitors had to qualify to work in NIH. So that was like the Marine Corps. We only hire the best. We only keep the best. So I kept working there. I worked there for 20 years. And, uh, and uh, eventually I became uh, I stopped being recruited for, for, for different jobs because of what I did. I was recruited by uh, a, uh, leather, leather laboratories in, in, uh, in Pearl River, New, New, New York, to become a, a, uh, one, of their, one of their technicians. And uh, they, offered me, they offered me a position that, that was very enticing. They wanted to double my salary at that time, which was about five thousand dollars a year, and they told me they would give me a house if I if I would if I would come to work for them. And of course, I asked my father, you know, again, who whom I always consulted about such things as that. What should I do? And he said, "Well, son, are you happy doing what you're doing now?" I said, "Yeah." He said, "Well, don't throw your career away for." For something, because you're gonna work all the life. And if you're not happy in, your, in what you're doing, life will be miserable. So I rejected it off and decided I would stay there. Well, it turned out that what happened, uh, this, this guy, McBride, had, had gone to Caltech to get further training to work with a man named Del Becco. And while he was in Del Becco's laboratory, he learned how to. to to assay polio virus in a way that was very unique. One of the, one of the problems at that time is that the salt polio vaccine had just been released and people were you know, infected by it. They still had polio and nobody knew why. They thought the vaccine was that, it was, salt polio vaccine was a form of an inactivated vaccine, not, not a live vaccine. Uh, when McBride had found out he could identify where the infected virus came from, they began this vaccine through, through a process called neutralization kinetics. And so he taught me how to calculate all this mathematically. Well, by that time I had uh, decided that, uh, that I wanted to, wanted to work as a uh, on a virus, so, so I chose to work on a virus that nobody else was working on. At, at that time, there were only three people in, in the country working on herpes simplex virus, fever blisters. So I decided I would, I would uh, start working with, on after stomatitis, 
it hurt me simplex. So I, so I, I, you know, had done some things that I, to for NIH that they were very pleased with. When I refused to go 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 to work at Pearl River, the director of the institute uh, told me that if I had gone, they would have to close that laboratory up, and NIH would lose all that money, and they wouldn't have would have a, a, a virus program. And he told me. He never shook hands, just told me, he said, if you stick with me, I'll stick with you. And I said, well, I guess if, you, if that's your word, I believe you. So I, so I didn't go. I turned it down, even though it was very attractive to do that. And, and what happened after that is that, uh, that uh, McBride left Caltech, and instead of coming back to the age, he went to work in work work in 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 in, uh, in, in, in with a guy named Joe Melnick. He had a bailer. He gave up the laboratory and left me there. So they told me that, that well, well, you 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 run the laboratory. And they asked me how long would it take me to finish up the work that McBride left me to do. I told him about six months. They said you got thirty days. He finished all his experiments, sent him the data so he can calculate it, and we will close the lab up. Well, I said, well, you know, I'm going to work myself out of a job. That's crazy. But I did. I worked overtime for 30 straight days. I mean, from 8, 8.30 in the morning to 9 o'clock at night. And got paid overtime, time and a half, for doing it. Well, the things would turn out that that was a blessing because I wanted to buy a house for Grace, for Grace and the, and the kids, but I didn't have money enough to to pay down on the house. But by working all that overtime, I made enough money in thirty days to be able to buy a house. Before that, we were living in, uh, in, in and I never lived in an apartment. Building per se, we had apartments, but they were, you know, but but they, they they were private homes, and by that time we had, uh, <laughs> we had a baby every year. <laughs> we wound up having having five children, and <laughs> I always thought that uh, that that my children, my children, I always thought were the most precious thing to me. Uh, so, so it meant that, that Grace could now live like Mrs. Poteet. She became a housewife and a mother. Uh, Grace was, uh, did not have a job outside the house until my youngest daughter was in the sixth grade. She, and so I provided do everything. We, we bought the house, of course. We still we still live in it. Uh, we bought it in 1957, and amazingly enough, we paid fourteen thousand dollars, fourteen thousand five hundred dollars for the house. That was, and I got it on a GI bill at four and a half percent interest. And when I when I left, I worked there. Worked in NIH until until 1971. And became a became the 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 the, the only African American to become a senior scientist in the Dental Institute. So consequently, you know that was kind of you know, kind of special in a sense because the NIH was always trying to brag about how integrated it was. Uh, I'd be working in the lab sometime, and all of a sudden they have visitors come there, and they want to show. They, 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 see, this, this is this is our, our, our testimony to the fact that we are integrated. This is Dr. Ash, he's doing this stuff. I didn't have a doctor. And that, all, that always bothered me, in fact, I didn't. So in 1961, uh, my, my, I had a new lab chief, a man named Henry William Sherp, who was professor of, of, uh, of microbiology at, uh, in, 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 uh, in in, in up in Upper State New York, he came to NIH, became my lab chief, and he asked me what 
know what, what was I doing? What I had done, start working with a man named Irwin Shipp, who was a dentist on aphthous pneumothitis. So uh, he decided after I wrote, I, I wrote, my handwriting was so bad that he never could really tell what I was doing. So they, they, I was the only one in my institute that they gave a typewriter to. <laughs> so, so, so I could tell him what I did. So, so I, I wrote up this paper and everything. He said, Warren said, uh, you know, uh, this, this is good work you've done. I said, really? He said, yeah. He said, it's all negative data. I said, well, nobody reports negative data. He said, well, negative data is just as good as positive data because it tells people what not to do. So I published my first paper in 1961 in, 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 a, in a journal called Archives of Oral Biology. It's sponsored by the International Association of Dental Research. And, uh, and you know, that became every paper after that, when they started talking after stomatitis, because it was a, a oral disease, nobody knew what caused it, it just shows up. Uh, so, uh, Irwin Shipp, and I put, we, so the paper was titled, uh, uh, you know, <laughs> After Stomatitis Virus and Fever Blitz from Cold Sores. The authors were Ship Ash and Shirt. Now you, if you say it fast, you can say you imagine what what what, what would come out. <laughs> it's just, so Irwin Irwin Ship uh, eventually uh, left the help public health service and took a job at, at the University of Pennsylvania Dental School in Philadelphia. I I stayed in in the lab, and so it turns out that uh, what they would do because of uh, of how I was, I became an expert at growing cells, cells like healer cells that, that were cells isolated in 1951 by a man named Jerome Silverton from a woman named Helen Lane, who was a black woman who had, who had cervical, cervical cancer. He, he established these cells, and they called healer cells, contracted her name. And they became immortalized, and so they they would grow indefinitely. So I, I grew I grew those and everything. So uh, so uh, I I left, left there, and then uh, then I was pretty happy, you know, being in IH. Eventually, I became a, a senior administrator. I became a health, became a health science administrator, and uh, and because I knew the system and. And at this time, excuse me, at this time you, you still had not gone back for your doctorate? No, that, 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 that came later. You see, one of the things I found out that, uh, that, uh, that I tried to do things without a doctorate that most people with a doctorate did. So by publishing everything and, and, and studying herpes simplex, I was unique in a sense. So uh, uh, that went on, and then, then once, I'd always want to go to Howard. My father went to the Howard, and so so, so I, I worked there for 21 days, 21 years, and became a a senior administrator. Uh, I was I was approving research for people all across the world on oral diseases, oral oral stomatitis was that was what I did, and then one Sunday afternoon in May of 1971, uh, we had gone to church. And was had come had come home, and uh, and the telephone rang, and my oldest son Bobby asked the phone, and he said, "Daddy, is some man on the phone name said he wants to speak to you about a position." And so I asked the phone, and I said, "Hello, who's this?" He said, "I'm I'm Dr. Marion Mann. I'm dean of the Howard University College of Medicine, and I'm offering you a position in my administration." And salary is no object. I said, wait a minute, where are you calling from? He said, Hal University. The first thing I thought about then was my childhood prayer, which was, the Lord help me to get into that medical, medical school. I never asked to be a doctor. I just wanted to get in, in that medical, medical school. So we, we agreed upon a salary 
And so I decided I would go there. Now, I was being recruited by the University of Alabama in Birmingham by a man named Joe Volker, who was a uh, brilliant man. He, he, uh, he, he was the only man in Alabama that Governor Wallace called his excellency. Uh, Joe was, uh, had always been determined that he would one day immigrate his administration. And when I first met him, the first thing he asked me was our prayer man. I told him, yeah. Well, Joe, Joe was, a, was a, a lay minister in, in his church. So when that minister left, Joe preached a sermon. So, so he was very much in, in, into that. And so I said, I told him, yeah, okay, well, one day I'll come. Well, he offered me a job to come there, to come, to come to Birmingham. So when uh, Dr. Mann called me that Sunday, uh, I, I told Grace, I said, well, you know, we, we, I'm planning on leaving, leaving in the age. She said, where are we going? I said, we're not going, we're going to stay here. I told her, I said, well, I've been offered a job at Howard. First thing she said, how, what could Howard do for you? I said, well, it's not a question what Howard can do for me. For me, it's what I can do for Howard. So uh, we took it back and forth. I went to my director and told him the same thing. He, he cussed me out and said, you're throwing your career away. Because Howard University you know, was not known to be a research institution. So I, so I decided that, uh, that so, I, so I resigned from NIH on Christmas Eve of 1971, which was a, which was a Friday, and started working at Howard that Tuesday. As an, as an assistant dean and as, a, and as an instructor in microbiology, because I negotiated a, a salary. <laughs> I still didn't have a PhD. Uh, and so I joined this, you know, this school, which was full of nothing but these so called brilliant men, all of them doctors, everything. So I, I decided, well, to be unique, don't call me Mr., don't call me Doctor. Call me Dean Ash. <laughs>